It's now my pleasure to present the Dr. Charles Melieu Award for Achievement in Vaccinology and Immunology that honors individuals whose outstanding lifetime contributions to the fight against vaccine preventable diseases have led to significant improvements in public health. The award is named for Dr. Charles Merieu, the distinguished French scientist who devoted his life to fighting infectious diseases globally, combining his medical knowledge with an understanding of business to develop one of the world's leading vaccine laboratories, the Pasteur Institute. Dr. Merieu was also a founder of the French Institute of Foot and Mouth Disease, later renamed the Merieu Institute, and used in vitro cultivation to produce millions of doses of vaccines. First offered in 2005, the award has been presented annually at the NFID Annual Conference on Vaccinology Research with support from Sanofi US. It's my honor and distinct pleasure to present the 2021 Dr. Charles Merrier Award for Achievement in Vaccinology and Immunology to Dr. Barney Graham in recognition of his outstanding contributions in the fight against infectious diseases. Dr. Graham is the Deputy Director of the Vaccine Research Center at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and is also Chief of the Center's Viral Pathogenesis Laboratory at the NIH. He received his undergraduate degree from Rice University, his medical degree from the University of Kansas School of Medicine, and his doctorate in microbiology and immunology from Vanderbilt University School of Medicine, where he also completed an internal medicine residency, two chief residencies, as well as a fellowship in infectious diseases. Arnie, on behalf of NFID, it is truly a pleasure to virtually present you with the 2021 Merieu Award. We're so glad that you're able to join us and we welcome your remarks. Thank you, Bill, for that kind introduction. Good afternoon, I'm Barney Graham, Deputy Director of the NIAID Vaccine Research Center at the Bethesda campus of NIH. Thank you to the organizers and the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases for this great honor. Being linked in any way to Charles Merieu and the Merieu family is a special recognition for anyone involved in vaccine development. I'm showing some scenes from La Pensier and Annecy where the advanced course on vaccines is taught as one of many legacies from the Merieu Foundation. I also wanna acknowledge some of the many people from Vanderbilt University School of Medicine who started me thinking about vaccines. Peter Wright, Kathy Edwards, Bill Gruber, and David Carzon are all vaccinologists in pediatrics. Bill Schaffner and John Oates in medicine, Peter Collins, who was one of the draws to come to NIH, and my lab and clinical groups, some of whom came with me to the VRC. VRC was founded in 2000 to develop an HIV vaccine. And even though we have not accomplished that yet, the technologies driven by that effort have been used to develop vaccines for other problems, including emerging viruses listed here. We can do that because we are privileged not only to have a basic research facility, but engineers who do process development and pilot scale manufacturing, a self-contained clinic and a lab devoted to GLP analysis of clinical specimens. We've made many different types of vaccine products over the years and tested them around the world. We have an ongoing need for vaccines and traditional approaches have been important, but limited in solving public health crises. Historically, new vaccines have often been developed because of new technologies. The first two for smallpox and rabies were made by growing attenuated virus in animals. Learning how to grow viruses in eggs made the initial yellow fever and influenza vaccines possible. The next cluster came from the discovery of cell culture allowing the production of large amounts of virus for either live or inactivated whole virus vaccines. Next was the era of molecular biology with vaccines based on recombinant proteins, virus-like particles, reassortants, and molecular clones with production in bioreactors. The recent VSV Ebola vaccine was the first gene-based vaccine vector licensed. The next vaccinology era 
I believe, will be informed largely by structural biology. We thought RSV might be the first example of that, but SARS-2 snuck in before and illustrated the power of many new technologies. Some of these allow more precision in antigen design and immune response measurements. Others increase the speed of development and manufacturing. This roughly translates into pandemic preparedness, which is a long-term endeavor and, and pandemic response, which by its nature needs to be as fast as possible. We've envisioned a systematic approach to pandemic preparedness organized around viral entry mechanisms, working towards a comprehensive database of structures, reagents, pathogenesis models that could be supported by a centralized capacity for immune analysis, process development, and manufacturing. We refer to this as the prototype pathogen approach for pandemic preparedness and response. This is derived in part from our work on class one fusion proteins that are present on many envelope viruses of concern. In 2013, in collaboration with Jason McClellan, who was a postdoctoral fellow in Peter Kwong's lab, we were able to capture the pre-fusion structure of the respiratory syncytial virus F protein. This revealed a new neutralization sensitive epitope at the apex that disappears when F rearranges as it often does spontaneously. Antibodies to what we call site zero have a hundred to a thousand times greater neutralizing potency than antibodies that recognize the post-fusion structure. This explains the finding in at least five large efficacy trials done over the last several decades with this molecule that only boosts neutralizing activity about two to three fold. However, if you stabilize the pre-fusion conformation with the C-terminal trimerization domain and internal disulfide and cavity filling mutations, becomes a vaccine antigen that can boost neutralizing activity with a single dose and without adjuvant. These types of fusion proteins all work the same way. The protein unfolds, stacking helical domains to project the hydrophobic fusion peptide into the cell, and then the heptad repeat regions pull the membranes together to allow entry of the viral nucleocapsid. And the protein ends up as a stable post-fusion molecule. You want vaccine-induced antibody to target the pre-fusion functional form of the protein. Class one fusion proteins share functional homology and many motifs and domains, but have different shapes. The F protein is very similar to the paramyxovirus F proteins, but hemagglutinin, HIV envelope, Ebola or Lassa GP have a cap over the fusion machinery that needs to come off. The coronavirus spike protein has both the S1 cap and an intervening segment. There are a lot of shared features, not only within virus families, but across virus families. Having failed to get an efficacy result in 2014, when we had an Ebola vaccine on the shelf ready for phase one, and we're in phase three within a year, but in Liberia where the epidemic waned earlier. Again in 2016, when we made a DNA vaccine for Zika in 100 days from sequence selection to phase one, and we're in a phase 2B in the Caribbean, Central America and South America in about 14 months, but again, the epidemic waned. Therefore, we made a deal with Moderna, who we worked with during the Zika response in 2017 to combine our antigen design capabilities with their rapid manufacturing platform, or mRNA, to do a demonstration project with a prototype pathogen concept. We worked with paramyxoviruses and coronaviruses, two large families with extensive zoonotic reservoirs with capacity for airborne transmission. Nipah was the prototype for paramyxoviruses and MERS was the prototype for coronaviruses. Paramyxoviruses have both a fusion protein and an attachment protein. Either can be the major target for neutralizing activity. We learned how to stabilize the pre-fusion form of F and to express the attachment proteins for NEPA, measles, and mumps. In each case, the pre-fusion F was more immunogenic for neutralizing activity than the post-fusion. In one version, we combined a pre-fusion 
molecule with a fold-on trimerization domain and three attachment proteins in one construct and showed that mRNA immunization with the chimeric molecule could protect ferrets from lethal challenge with mepovirus. While solving the prefusion RSVF structure, MERS coronavirus emerged in the Middle East. Since there were no available structures for coronavirus spike, and since Jason McClellan was beginning a new faculty position, we decided to work together and apply our RSV findings to coronaviruses. Three years later, and in collaboration with Andrew Ward at Scripps, we obtained a cryo-EM structure for the spike protein of the endemic human coronavirus HKU1. A year later, we had stabilizing mutations using a two-proline substitution at the top of the central helix that worked across multiple coronaviruses. Importantly, the 2PP mutation not only preserved neutralization sensitive apical epitopes, but stabilizing the protein significantly increased protein expression from transduced cells, which would be an advantage for gene-based vaccine delivery. Using the S2P mRNA for MERS, we showed that human DPP4 transgenic mice could be protected from lethal challenge in collaboration with Ralph Barrick at UNC. This is where we were when the Wuhan outbreak was announced on December 31st of 2019. We'd been planning to do a phase one trial of mRNA for the Nipah virus during 2020. However, when we learned on January 6th that the outbreak in Wuhan was likely to be a beta coronavirus, I spoke to Stefan Bonsell at Moderna and we decided to flip the demonstration project to coronavirus when the sequences were released and to run the drill. Based on our prior work with MERS coronavirus and informed by our findings with RSV, guided by our thinking about pandemic preparedness and motivated by our prior responses to public health emergencies of international concern, as soon as the sequences were released on January 10th, we designed constructs using the 2P substitution to make protein for antibody assays, for solving structures, for B-cell probes, and for an mRNA vaccine. After agreeing on the approach with Moderna scientists on the 13th, we sent the sequences and they returned clinical grade mRNA in 41 days. The phase one was started on day 65 and the phase three in about six months. In the meantime, we had developed assays, performed preclinical studies in, in mice and macaques to support the clinical development. A byproduct of these new technologies are the reagents needed for human monoclonal antibody discovery that we carried out with Abcellar and, and Lilly, leading to a BAMLA-Nivimab that is authorized now for emergency use. These are ciliated airway cells infected with SARS coronavirus 2. This is an enlarged view, and this shows that the virus is at about 80 nanometers in diameter and decorated with knobs that are the spike protein, the major surface feature on the virus. This is why it is the primary vaccine antigen used in the more than 250 vaccine development programs globally. This is another testament to the way new technologies have not only changed the way we think about vaccine development, but made a variety of approaches much more accessible. Once you know that the protein is in the right conformation, it gives you the confidence to develop assays as we did with the CDC, discover monoclonal antibodies, and to make vaccines. And because of the prior work on protein design, several other vaccine developers are also using the 2P version of Spike as noted by the red asterisk. Three of these are now authorized for emergency use and at least one dose has been administered to more than 120 million Americans. As we look forward, what are some of the remaining challenges? If we focus on the 26 virus families known to infect humans, there are about 120 viruses of concern. We advocate for choosing one or two prototypic pathogens from each family to develop and evaluate products through phase one. The others could be evaluated at least through animal model testing. We feel like this systematic approach uh, will serve better over the next 20 years than just prioritizing 
certain pathogens of concern as, as have been suggested by others. The vaccines for each virus family should be fit for purpose for each individual pathogen, but designed with generalizability in mind. It is likely that there will be many lessons that can be shared across these families. Some families will have more clear choices than others as noted by the blue highlights. There's still a lot of work to do on most of these families noted in yellow. However, there are only four major pathogens in my opinion that present major biological challenges that will need significant breakthroughs to reach a solution including HIV, the retrovirus, influenza and orthomyxovirus, hepatitis C, a flavivirus and several of the herpes viruses. To achieve vaccine countermeasures for those, we need to address cross-cutting questions in biology and engineering that I list here. The chief among them is antigenic variation and a few other features of viruses related to how they evade immunity. To improve the effectiveness, safety, and usefulness of vaccines, we also need advances in immunology and protein engineering. So my predictions or hopes for the 21st century are that many of the questions above would be answered. I also assume that detailed structural information will guide future vaccine development efforts, including the ability to display multiple antigens on custom designed nanoparticles. I hope that learning more about how to target our vaccine antigens to the right locations and lymph nodes may reduce the need for adjuvants. I also hope that what we've learned from the current pandemic event is that we are all in this together and need global agreements to address regional problems, including manufacturing capabilities distributed into low and middle income countries. These are not so different from the things I had hoped for in 2009, many of which have come to pass during this uh, last year and others partially fulfilled. There's only a few uh, that are on the current list that still haven't been accomplished. I will end by being thankful that many of my friends and colleagues and frontline workers have now been vaccinated and that we can celebrate vaccination of our family members and other important people. I wanna thank my wife, Dr. Cynthia Turner Graham in particular, who has put up with me and helped me get through this last year and thank the PIs and program heads at the VRC, Jason McClellan, who has been a strong collaborator on structure over many years, Dr. Kizmiki Corbett, pictured here with my lab group, who led the coronavirus team over the last few years to define epitopes and vaccine approaches, along with our collaborators, Moderna, Vanderbilt, UNC, and many others who have helped to make this last year possible. In addition, virtually everybody at the VRC pivoted from their normal activities to help with this uh, coronavirus program and to help us uh, advance the Moderna product uh, through into phase three testing and authorization for emergency use. So thank you very much and I'll take any questions. <laughs>